Kucher, and welcome back to Center Frame Interview, where we talk to talented filmmakers from all around the world. And I'm super excited to talk to Daniel Mosel today, who is a sort of compatriot of mine. He's uh, originally from Germany, but now is based in Austria. And uh, um, I'm super excited to talk to him because he's made a fantastic uh, short film trilogy called MeTube, uh, and which had millions of views on uh, on the internet and also garnered some great festival recognition so daniel thank you very very much for joining me guten tag guten morgen guten nachmittag uh, uh, nachmittag guten, nach alles gut. guten tag guten tag yeah <laughs> how are you how's it going yeah uh, by the way my name is moschel moschel <laughs> really, oh really so it's it's, so, so so even it's with, like, with... Uh, it's an issue since 40 years so no worries. Oh, interesting. Okay, because I've I heard, heard it is... Mosel and stuff like that, but it's written wrong, you know. <laughs> so it's so it's so it's so it is Moschel with an S H. It's Moschel, yes. It's, it's, interesting. Uh, it's like Chen and Mo, <laughs> Moschel. Okay, that okay. Yeah. I stand corrected. I apologize. Um, <laughs> so uh, so, uh, uh, but thanks for joining me. Um, we haven't spoken in a little bit. Actually, we were supposed to do this interview a few weeks ago, and I had to sort of postpone it, unfortunately. Uh, but. Uh, I'm so glad we get to finally talk because um, you joined the community fairly early on. I think you were like the first or second person I spoke to to join the core community. Um, and uh, and I'm so glad you did because it's been a really, really fantastic ride over the last six uh, months. I appreciate it so much. And it's, a, it's an honor to be one of the first. So uh, I'm really excited about where it's heading. Yeah, no, it's great. And, and just for clarity, we didn't know each other before we started talking about such so this is not like me it's like contacting a friend of mine that's no, like i genuinely loved his short films and thought this guy needs to be with us yeah he uh, though, though we are both from austria right <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's actually what i wanted to talk to you about is that um your background is slightly more complicated than you being from austria so because you're not originally from austria right no, these days we should be Europeans, right? <laughs> but no, it's uh, the origin is uh, basically my my parents are migrants from Russia and Georgia, uh, came over Israel to Germany, and there I was born. So uh, I lived the first half of my life in Germany and moved around there a bit, ended up in Bavaria, and then uh, it became Vienna. Since twenty years, I'm already here. So twenty. So you're Viennese now. I mean. You're no, Viennese, I'm Viennese now. Yeah, like, I am. But I am also not because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's say I'm a German speaking whatever. <laughs> it's, but this is the nature of it, right? Because what one thing I've really loved about this whole interview series that I've done so far is that people's backgrounds are always far more complicated than what you'd think. You know, so somebody isn't just from one place. People's identities are so much more complicated now, more yeah. so than ever before. You know, and I find that um, that complexity really comes out in people's work because the inspiration just comes from more places. I think it's really important to mix up, you know, that's the only the only way we as a world community can be a world community if we separate, like, you know, what's happening. And uh, you see it in dogs, too. If you have a uh, mix between dogs, you know, they live longer, happier and stuff, you know, and if you have all the same on one pile, they die early. So. Yeah, I mean, it's the that's the thing. Diversity flourishes. That's the point. You know, is that <laughs> sure. and 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 the and what, what and that's one thing that we're trying to do with Center Frame too is to just, we need to promote the diversity of ideas. You know, we don't want just one way of filmmaking or one type of thing. You know, so yeah. that's one thing I really loved about your short films is because I have to say these are some of the most unconventional short films I've ever seen because I've been trying to figure out for this very intro how to describe MeTube as a film to people because it is all the things <laughs> you know yeah it's i don't know it's like because it's 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 a music video it's an opera it's a comedy it's tragic you know it's 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 all the things so i want to hear from you what you think MeTube is it was planned as a web chart right that we want to do a thing which is kind uh, works with elements which you usually see don't see in this combination like opera and 
Transformers or Pulp Fiction, let's say that, yeah. And um, we wanted to put it out. The first one, which, which, which was made in 2012, came out 13. We just wanted to put it out on YouTube, and I was hoping maybe that I can achieve 100k views. This would make my day. <laughs> Never would have this kind of successful film before, so it was like, yeah, uh, mission accomplished. But you know, uh, it's you know the expectations were broken even with us. And it became a kind of hit, and we call it here uh, after this period of time the Aya liegen the Wollmichsau. It, uh, it was, you know, it was like, you know, I don't know how to describe it in English, but it's like, uh, it, you know, uh, some people uh, called out, said, hey, you want to enter that in the music video festival? I said, okay, we didn't intend it to, but then we entered. And then another festival called, and then we knew, okay, it's a festival film. So we had, then we, the application started like half a year later, you know, because we didn't want to do that. And after one year, Sundance came. So, like I said, it was basically our most successful film so far. And uh, the first one was on 300 festivals and got like 30 awards or something like that. Amazing. So, Amazing. Uh, and we thought, yeah, let's do a second one because we did it the American way. So. Hey, <laughs> you know what? Was, <laughs> success, I'm... why not do it second? I mean, but I'm glad you did because um, uh, just just for clarity, Eierlegen de Wollmilchsau <laughs> is basically uh, an animal that can do everything. You know, um, it's it and it's like golden. It's the thing you don't expect to work, but somehow it can do everything. Yeah, because you know? it was invited on niche festivals like a porn festival, but also on conventional festivals and even Sundance, you know, everything. It was like... Um, queer festivals, it was like horror, uh, comedy, then, you know, all kinds of festivals invited to the film, and we didn't, yeah, accept that, uh, expect that at all, so. I think that's great, and, and I'm glad you were able to take this weird everything concept that the original one had, and what I find so interesting is how intimate the original one is compared to the final piece, you know what I mean, like, I think the third one, yeah. But we'll get to the third one. But I think you really managed to escalate from the first one to the second way, second one in a very healthy, fun way, you know, and managed to add, you managed to add absurdist elements, you know what I mean? Like things that were absurd before, you managed to add to them and it worked totally fine, you know? In fact, I mean, I loved it. So I want to talk. Thank you. So, so I want to know from you, how you developed the first one and how that changed your development for the second one. Before I start talking about development, usually our, our development time or my development time takes a lot of time. It's oh, really? always like, you know, I'm always sitting down and I'm, I'm brewing stuff together and uh, I kick it out again. And it took like the first one, it took like half a year. Really? <laughs> you know? wow. um, because, you know, I had the impression I had a kind of budget, and I wanted I don't I didn't want to uh, to kick it out in the air and do something generic. So my intention was always to let's do something. Let's do. And my intention was also to because August, who approached me and said, "Here, uh, I know you're a filmmaker. Um, I did a film with your wife. My wife is an artist." I want to do a film with you too. And so I was thinking, okay, what, what's my ambition is? My ambition is to make him a little bit more popular than he was before as a singer, as an opera singer. So how can I do that? And that's why I was sitting down. I was thinking, okay, I need to, I, I want to touch the YouTube community. And that's why it became this kind of homage to YouTube, we call it, the first one especially, because it starts up, it starts like yeah. a usual web clip and the you know like millions of others uh doing right and um yeah and then it was easy to if you start up like that you have enough headspace and room up to you know break the expectation because you start really trashy you know with the webcam somebody sings in front of the webcam how can i put a level on top of, of that and after we did it the first one it became a kind of 
harder. <laughs> oh, how can we, what do we? What do we do with the SQL? Okay, we need to, to to put again a layer on top on that, and then it became really effective. You know, I mean, effective in 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 terms of you know effects. <laughs> yeah. And yes, uh, this took also one year planning at least. You know, we did a. Uh, animatic, which took us a year because we are not the 3D specialist here. It was Eugen and me sitting there and, you know, building all that. We didn't know, do we shoot it outside, this kind of flash mob, or do we shoot it in a, in, in a studio? And this is like a, the flash mob of outer space, you know, right. so just uh, to, to, to get you a clue what it's about. So, and then we had to time everything, yeah? We had the score, we need to, and then we did this animation film before we did the real film. Right, of so course. This also a year, so just, uh, this was a long answer, right? Yeah, no, no, it's, uh, I, what, what I think is interesting is, um, can, can you tell me about your, your, where you drew inspiration from? Did you look, I mean, you said the first one was sort of an homage to YouTube. I mean, they're all homages to YouTube in their own way, but, did you look at YouTube to find yes. ideas and, yeah. and, and then yeah, the second... looked at, I looked at thousands of uh, films, you know, but you know, not like uh, I looked at films which were like uh, usually getting 100 views or something <laughs> because, you know, I wanted to start, a, start off with uh, low key that people are really thinking they are watching a uh, web clip, you know. Yeah. So that's why I, I was looking at women who, you know, were hovering their their house uh, with a bikini just to get some views and, uh, and and reading the instruction manual. I was looking at old guys singing Maria, so just you know for their friends and family, and they did really well. You know, I was thinking, wow. I checked out some other interpretations of Camina, uh, not Camina, of uh, the, the Habanera. You know, yeah, uh, just to see how other people. You know, is, is, is there a male singing the Habanera? Because this is kind of un, kind of unusual, right? Yeah. So uh, there was one, and I was thinking, hey, this is a good idea. Let's 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 do that with uh, because I didn't know which piece we take, which song. Which... Who came up with Habanera? It was me because. Oh, it was you? <laughs> yeah, it was like. Uh, I love Habanera because yeah. it's one of the pieces I knew. I'm, I'm not, my mother was in opera, but I'm not really. So I wasn't. Now I am much more than before. Of course. So uh, I didn't know anything, but Habanera I knew. So I was thinking if I know Habanera, others know them, it's all maybe too. So like in the passive brain, you know, <laughs> somewhere it's safe, yeah, this melody. And it helps if somebody knows it already, you know. So all these elements came up, came together, and yeah, Meteor was born. Fantastic. So, um, where did you look first when you wanted to escalate the story for the second part? Like, because um, obviously you went outdoors for the second one as opposed to indoors with the first one. So, did it was yeah. that sort of the starting point, or did you look elsewhere to escalate the size of the scale of it? If you say two, you have to say three or two, right? So uh, we were thinking. Um, how can we, you know, um, prolong the story? How can we develop the story? Because, like I said, it wasn't planned to do be to be a trilogy. And then we were thinking, okay, these two guys, these nerds, they could be aliens from outer space, right? And they come here on on the Earth because they find they found maybe with the Voyager probe this golden record where there were some pieces of Mozart on that, and they were so much into opera after they were listening to that that they said that they they leave their outpost, their customs outpost, and they come to our planet and they get the <laughs> the, the worst the worst bodies you can get to uh, to 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 immerse into opera. So this old woman and this nerd, you know, who has some kind of gimps in his basement, right? So I love these it. are their tools to to achieve their goal. So this, and, and you are laughing, but actually we developed also a TV show after we were uh, asked by some guys from the US. And there were some really A actors uh, involved in that, but it didn't really wow. happen. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow, we pitched it a few times, but nobody had the guts to do that. So. I mean, I <laughs> so have to say, story, you know? and uh, the 
backstory. And then we thought, okay, if there are two aliens, they go, what, what would be next? So after they prove themselves in, the, in front of the webcam um, and got some self-esteem, right? Uh, they move on the next step on the street, so like street musicians, and then they pull out the hardest or the, the, the challenging flash mob, right? The spaceships and transformers yeah. again. I love it. I, one of the references that I spotted very, very quickly was uh, with the uh, carousel that builds to these absurdist heights, right? Um, yeah. And I recognized that from a viral clip where somebody, a VFX artist, had basically taken these uh, uh, theme yeah, park yeah, rides was, and made uh, extreme versions. I even asked this guy if he wants to be part of the team uh, because I, I love this film. This documentary. It's so good. I, think the I love that and it was clearly inspired by that uh and yes and and other stuff too and this epic was done by digic pictures which is a great company from budapest and uh, it's the best epic you know, <laughs> in the whole clip no it's great it was so good it was so fun like it's just some it's the thing you just don't expect to happen and i think yeah. that's one thing that really like got me about this this all three of them um is that they are extremely unpredictable because you don't have any you have enough solid footing to hold on to because you recognize YouTube things, mm -hmm. but then they always go into directions where you're like, what is, what is going on? What is that? But <laughs> never in a bad way, like always in a really positive, surprising way. And I, and I find that re a really interesting thing to achieve because I always have conversations with people about breaking rules and when can you, and when can't you, and what should you do and what shouldn't you do? And I, I, every time you go you come up against this idea no you can't do that you mm -hmm. always find an example that goes no but look they did it here why can't that work and then mm -hmm. you and and i always find that music videos and short films and stuff like that always push these kinds of boundaries really hard you know they because they for some reason they can get away with things that feature films and stuff like that really struggle to do when they try to pull it off on a larger scale yeah, what you... you're absolutely right. I mean, I guess it's because you don't have so much people in between, right? So you don't have people who say what you can do and what you can't do, what the viewer likes, what he doesn't like, what, you know, you... That's like a sandbox short films because there is anyway no market. So yeah, <laughs> that's the reason why short films are so interesting to go for because right you can't lose something you you don't piss somebody off you you don't have usually a budget for shopping that's the counter side you know <laughs> you usually have to really make it happen somehow um yeah but it's a uh, definitely the advantage of short films do you think it's a, a problem with too many people working together like that you have um when a project gets to the size of a feature film that things are bound to get more safe or do no. you think it's just an idea? No, no, it's just not not this kind of not the team. I'm not talking about the team at all. I think uh, because our teams were really pretty big. No, no it's yeah. not that. It's not just the uh, the content and the thing you can you get green lit right uh, is you know they are restrictive uh, usually. If you say let's take the uh, broadcaster here in Austria or F, what can you pitch them? Right? Yeah. Usually. Usual stuff. Sometimes there is a peak. If there is, you know, if you're lucky, you get this peak, right? I don't, yeah. I'm not saying that just bullshit is happening. No, but it's really hard to 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 pitch something weird or something which is not really, you know, original. Um, and it's always hard because you have to convince so much people. You have to convince the broadcaster, you have the streamer, and then they have so much so so, so much of the table, right? So and and. On the, and you need at least 2.5 million euro for a film here in Austria. So it's some money, you know, and a short film is much less uh, of a risk, right? So you can do whatever you want to do. And then you don't have to get a green light from someone up there, a commission editor. I'm talking. So that's yeah. why. Yeah. No, I think that, I don't I think think that it's uh, harder to achieve a film when the team is bigger. On the counter side, if, if the team works good together i think that's the best way the best thing what happens to you right so you have a good working team you don't have to do like five jobs in, in a union <laughs> i agree i agree um so so the i think the 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 big question then for me is now 
coming from MeTube 2, where do you, you decided to make a third one. Did you know you were going to make a third one after you did the second one? Or was that only, yeah, yeah you already course, knew that. Like I said, uh, it's, if you say two, you have to say three. So, so they were, we to, they were thing. developed together. Yeah, I mean, if 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 we would suck so much with the second one, we wouldn't do the third one. Right? Yeah. But then we ended up uh, with the second one. I think we are one of the first shorts which uh, consider themselves to be a sequel, which ended up on Sundance again. Right. <laughs> so wow. At the premiere there. So and then of course we had to do three. And the three, the third one was like you wanted to do something more conventional, conventional storytelling, not this experimental thing like one and two where so this was our premise and also because we wanted to sell this tv show we thought maybe this short helps us to sell it a bit mm -hmm. and yeah so this conventional story well happened. conventional is uh <laughs> <laughs> i mean but i know what you mean it has a more linear narrative like a more yeah. clear narrative to tell you know and that's, and that's i loved I mean. that adoption i thought that was a really really good idea because it evolves what could look like okay it's just a gimmick of random stuff it actually yeah. says no it's not just a gimmick of random stuff this is clearly thought out world building and yeah. now we're going to tell a story with that you know and I, I i love that i think it's really good and i love that you, you that there's enough room left for the audience to still go okay but what what does this mean what does that mean where does that go but you still have an, a good story to tell and i like that there's now a story of envy and jealousy and, and so I, I think that that was a, what made you take that approach like you could have you could have told any old stories how come a story of envy because this was planted already in the first one because right. the, the the his mother is you know adjusting all this all the time you know he he needs oh, yeah, that's good when, point, he, yeah. when he's into women he says no uh what's the i think He's to women and, he, and she likes men more. So she thinks men are the right thing for him. You yeah. know? So, so he, she's always adjusting. And, and of course, uh, we took that element and we brought it back in the third one because it's a good story. And also we got many, many influences there, you know, from Star Wars, Men in Black, whatever. You know? It took also me before we started a production like a year at least a year to come up with the final outline and then Eugen and me wrote it down to the script but you know with this kind of movie you need to have a short a real you know storyboard and everything boarded out like of course. because we had also the score before we had you know the storyboard of course so and then we, you know, did again this cinematic with the with the storyboard. It was a fun process. I love this. If you have this time, you know, to develop something in this detail, I love that kind of process because it gives you confidence. You know, when you're on set, then you know what you're doing. You know, it has to work within this because it worked out already on these drawings. You know, so. I, I'm not this kind of guy who's shooting. I mean, I'm doing a document right now, but usually. I'm not the guy going out there shooting something because I'm afraid of failing and, and sucking in this period of time. So you want to have, so you like having certainty walking into a situation. Yeah, usually I am, but I want to challenge myself. That's why I do you know two documentaries and, and see what's happening. And I did some already before. No, they are completely different projects. Usually, I mean, but it's different. If you yeah. do something narrative, I'm on the safe side let's say so yeah yeah of course now but i was about to say that it's like with with documentaries you can only plan so much the whole nature yeah. of a documentary is that you see what yeah. you find you know what i mean you don't yeah. know exactly what you're going to find and that's really a fun process i love that too yeah but it's if a... you do fiction work i'm not this uh, last frontier guy or i mean he's planning for sure too but when these first movies i'm not sure if this was all planned out like that you know right <laughs> it doesn't look like that it looks like intuitive filming right yeah <laughs> But maybe that's his genius. I, I, don't, I mean, I, don't know. It's, I think I think the what I like about documentaries um, is I mean we're filming a documentary right now uh, uh, for our um, collaboration with the UK Film Festival. So um, uh, I, what I like about documentaries is that even though you have a fairly clear idea of the events that are going to unfold, it is like development and production at the same time. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you get to develop your story while you're producing it, you know? And I think yes, absolutely. that- Absolutely, absolutely. And, and absolutely. then you find in the moment, you find these things like, oh, I like that. I like that. I'm going to do something with that, you know? And then, but then you have to very quickly you know, adjust for that to make the next bit that you're going to film happen too. Yeah, you know? This is also a process I love. And I, at the moment, I enjoy that much more than sitting down a year and doing a five minutes. Uh, because I, I wouldn't like to do that right now again, you know, Yeah. <laughs> because it takes so much time of your life. Right. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the um, so so you've done so it, do you know how many views the trilogy has, you know, in total? Have you looked that no, up? I didn't count it, but uh, there are some of them, I don't know, so, so. several millions, I don't know <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, because I was wondering, like, because uh, some people like really care about it and other people just go, ah, it's done now. Like, whatever it is, it is, you know, so uh, I yeah, no, I, I'm not watching it at the moment, to be honest, <laughs> but uh, it's several millions and we are happy about that. Yeah, yeah happy about it. So, but, you know, it's also we did also some advertising for that. It's not like the millions are coming in there like that. It's you have to do something. Even if you are the most genius guy, you know, you have to do something and do marketing. And we had the marketing budget also for that. And so I was going to ask why... you about that. No, but I was going to, that was actually going to be my next question. It's like, how do you, um, how did you approach marketing this film? Like, well, like, because I feel like a lot of filmmakers forget that it's not enough to tell the story. You know what I mean? Because a lot of a lot of filmmakers think about, well, if I just make the movie, I'll find something, I'll get distribution. Like that seems to be the magic word, right? The magic word is I'll get distribution or I'll put it on YouTube or I'll, you know, and, and apparently that's supposed to be it. But it's absolutely not. You know, you need to have a strategy on how to get your material out there. If it's not somebody else doing it, it has to be you doing it. So yeah, I mean, what what was yours for the for the trilogy and has that evolved with each episode? The first one, we tried to know everything from, you know, small clips, which we uh, brought out on social media, whatever it was, photos and stuff like that. But I think it was just a tiny part, you know, and it was like after the first, because we weren't professionals in marketing in the first one. Yeah. No, no, we tried, you know, we, we, but everybody tries. I usually should be, you know, you should go to your local newspaper and you should write everyone, you know, to invite them to the release party, all this kind, yeah, because we did a big release party, the Vata Zona here in, uh, in Vienna. And uh, it's important, you know, you have to bring the people together. Yeah, you have to have your PR staff ready when it's asked for. And then when you have interviews, you have you give the interviews, right? So this is important. And then you need to kind of certain piece of luck too, yeah, that somebody spreads it, the word, and if, yeah, you make, it's mandatory yeah this kind of luck and i think nothing happens while if there is not this kind of this element of luck where somebody's spreading it who has a lot of followers and then it goes viral for some reason yeah like jimmy yeah. kimmel or whatever <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then the next one was easier because after we had all this database of the festivals who played it and all these different screening possibilities we contact them and said uh, there's a second one coming out and then if you have um, a good festival playing you then it's also helpful you know and this started out like that you know and then we put also some just advertising google ads stuff out there too so all this together makes it yeah? and uh, it's important that you don't just throw it there and say look people there's my new film so I think nothing <laughs> happens then, or the, the 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 probability is really low. Yeah, I mean, as you said, un, un, uh, unless you uh, have a bit of luck and somebody influential yeah. finds your stuff immediately, you, yeah. you're gonna have to push and find your audience. Yeah, for, for sure. And uh, this, yeah, I, so I, I totally ready. <laughs> now that this trilogy is done. What, what what are you working on next and what's uh what's coming up for you i mean you mentioned documentaries but is there anything else that um yeah i have, I have several fiction projects i'm working at the moment but uh one of them is like and uh, i think i'm working already since 10 years on it so right. and several years i worked with uh uh other uh, writers together so that it's because writing is not my 
my talent, I would say, yeah, Ex especially for the long format. So that's why I have uh, help from others. And yeah, I try to develop this kind of fiction films, which I like to do. I didn't do, I, I did, I didn't do porn and I didn't do a fiction film. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think porn, uh, I skipped porn, but fiction film I would like to try. I mean, Processing. yeah, a feature would be better to try than, than, yeah. than, than that. So it's, it's a little more challenging, you know, there's yeah, more challenging. narrative complexity to it, you know. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think, I think what's, uh, uh, so in terms of trying to pursue a feature, um, you clearly have the challenge that everyone else has, which is who's going to want it? and uh, who's gonna pay for it and where's it gonna come out. And there's so many different elements to, uh, to try and get a picture together. Where would you think is always the hardest for, you, uh, for this? Like, like where do you find that is the, the most difficult part to get your first sort of movement going on these things? I think first you need the story worth to be told, right? For you, for yourself, because you need to have this, um, What's that? Uh, Ostauer, what's that, Bernard? Oh, uh, endurance. <laughs> endurance or stamina, right? Yeah. To, to hold this long process. If you don't like your, your stuff or your material, you won't convince somebody else. <laughs> yeah. So you need to love it somehow. Uh, you need to love your characters, whatever it is, the topic, whatever it is, you need to hold on that. Because I think stamina is the most important thing because everything takes so long, right? Yeah. From the idea to the finally finished films, even here in Austria, it takes like average time is four years. I work already 10 years of my script. So um, that's one of the most important things. And then you have, you need to have fun uh, on every process, right? If I can't write it myself, I need to have help with other, and I'm, I'm sitting there and have a good time with my co-writers. Co so I enjoy the time. I think that's most important is that you enjoy the time doing that. And then, yeah, of course you need finances, you need, uh, but if you're convinced of the thing you have, I, I'm sure if you're convinced about your topic, which you, you write, you know, you can convince others too, and they give you the money to do that. So that's easy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you, um, how do you feel, um, how important is track record? for you yeah you know i mean and with track record i mean looking at a filmmaker's established um abilities because mm -hmm. i've i've always found that the hardest thing for people to get past is trying to convince people of something if you have haven't done anything before you know so where where do you how do you think that that's one of the biggest hurdles a lot of filmmakers find is the, is the track record it's clearly the case that if you build a house, you invite an architect and then you look at the track record of this architect and see, okay, did he build my house? No? Okay, I take another one. I take the one who wants to build, who builds the kind of house I want. So it's really important to have a track record, right? Of the problem with track record is you won't build another house <laughs> except of the houses you built. So... <laughs> Somebody has to trust you that you can build this other house. Then you can build the first the house. Of society, right? So everyone wants to be safe and everyone wants to do, if somebody gives you money, he wants to, you know, he needs to trust you that you can build this house. Of course, it helps if you have a track record and a festival and played your movie and stuff like that. And I hope, and on the other side, nobody would do another film if it would be the strict, right? So, yeah. <laughs> So there is uh, there is some gaps and you can get in there, but you have to fight for that, right? All you do like meet you one, two, three. It was easy for us to do that because you know the first one. Somehow they believed in us because we can do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really hard to come up with something new which works. So there's there are people who are you know known for one piece of work, artists. And they never get a, a, across that. So, so my, my fear, I stick with me to your all my life. No, but never. It's, it's, I think it's uh, if you enjoy the process of you know developing something new, then you are on the safe side. Then so, you at yeah. least enjoy enjoy doing it either way. Enjoy it, uh, whatever. Yeah. If it's not this successful, at least you're enjoying your life and your work. Yeah. So 
Absolutely. It's, I love that. I love that. So, um, finally, if you could pick a movie that you would have loved to have done, and it doesn't matter what it is, you know what I mean? But it's like, oh, I, that is my kind of movie. Wow. I, I love what that question. kind of movie. What, what, what movie would that be? Like, like if you, if you could say, what's your kind of movie, what is it? That's a good question. But I think I would pick La Haine from Matthew Kasowitz, La Haine, yeah. which is uh, done 1995. It's a fantastic Haine, movie. And I think it's a really powerful movie because I love it. I love these characters and everything in it. I, I, there's nothing I, I don't love about that. And it's my, if I would go to an island, I would take this movie with me to an island because the topic, especially now, you know, it's, they, they, you could make this movie in the today. The only thing you have to change is that the stupid smartphones are somehow in, somewhere in the picture. Yeah. <laughs> but some people are also not using that as a statistic device, right? So, I mean, it's, you, I, I, they are not using some smartphones, but you know, they, they, that's an up to date picture till now. And you could release it today and it would work still. So, what else can happen? Uh, I mean, that's why I would take this movie with me. Yeah, I think that's a great choice. I, I have to say, um, La Haine is a fantastic movie. I, I love it too. And I think uh, you're totally right. It's if it could be totally updated um, and left as is. And uh, you know what? I've seen some really, really clever dealings with smartphones where you don't even notice that they're in it. Like they're really, really clever at hiding the technology. And that's why, you know, the really good films just somehow find a way to not need it, you know? Yeah. Even though it exists, you know, I, I, you when, have, you, when it's well done, it's good. If you have a good example, please send it to me. Okay, yeah, I, I will, I will. Um, as I, but as I think the, uh, uh, I think it's 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 really really it, the one thing that's true about cell phones, is and we experienced this with my first movie is that people are so aware of their existence that the question is always, well, why don't they just call? You know, mm -hmm. why don't they just Google it. Why don't they just, do you know what I mean? And so you have to answer that question. And with a horror movie, that's really difficult. And you always have to find a really silly reason why the cell phone doesn't work. You know what I mean? And no power. Always no power. <laughs> it's yeah. Or just no signal or there's steel beams or there's something, but you need to say there is no power or you just have to set it in a time where there weren't any, you know? Mm. But then you're making a period movie and that changes everything, you know? So it, it's, it, it, the cell phone has become a very, very difficult, <laughs> a very, very difficult device when it comes to this. Before it was even a smartphone, but the smartphones made it harder um, when it comes to that. It's, but, but I think you can get away with quite a bit if you, if you at least find a way to address the cell phone question, you know? I think so. at least, you know. <laughs> yeah. Or sometimes you use it. The advantage of it is yeah, that you can um, do shortcuts, right? So, like people are doing that. They have to read, you have to watch, you have the split screen, then you have the text. It's like reading a second subtitle again. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. No, it's true. But when people are clever, like I've seen some very, very clever uses of texting, yeah. you know, where, uh, where people have, you know, just instead of showing the phone, yeah. you know, did something else. And I think that's very clever. Like when they, when they get clever with it, it's really good. And, and, yeah. and I'm Ooh. totally for that. You know, I don't, it's, if it's not technology reliant, yes. you know, I think that's good. And that's why, that's why, for example, if you look at, um, like back to the future or things like that, you know, where the technology itself doesn't matter if it doesn't evolve, you know what I mean? It's completely okay because within the world of the story, the technology is fine. You know, yeah. it's, you know, and I think as long as you manage to pull that off and don't make it the center of it, then the film doesn't date either. You know, then it doesn't matter. You know, now, I, it's 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 an interesting one. You know, yeah. so thank you very very much, Daniel. Moshel, Moshel, is it Moshel? Yes. Moshel. <laughs> okay. um, thank you, Daniel, for joining me. I have such a pleasure talking with you about your films, especially the trilogy, because it is such a bonkers, unique thing. I highly recommend if you haven't seen them, which you really need to, um, 
Go watch them. They're on YouTube. It's called MeTube. Um, and there's one, two, and three. Well, the first one's not called one, but it's MeTube by Daniel Moshel. And uh, watch them all. They are highly, highly unique. And I highly recommend you check them out. Also, check out Daniel's uh, profile on the centerframe.com website. And don't forget to sign up to our mailing list on our website as well while you're there. And check out our social media too. So thank you again, Daniel. I highly appreciate you joining us. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you very much, Bernard. It was a pleasure. <laughs>